said, we're going to be talking today about best practices for handling an insurance claim. We expect that this course will provide you all with a guideline for reporting, documenting, and mitigating a property loss. In addition, uh, the intention is that this course will advise and educate you on common insurance policy conditions and provisions with, uh, with which insureds and or their uh, uh, agents are obligated to comply prior to and during the insurance company's claim investigation. We will do our best uh, to provide you with a discussion regarding the retention of public adjusters, remediation service specialists, and other expert professionals. So let's get started. First, um, how should you, you know, first the kinds of questions that we're going to be talking to you about today are how should you report a loss? What are the insured's duties after a loss? What can an insured expect from the insurance company's claim investigation? Should an insurer, should an insured, should the policyholder hire experts to assist with respect to the claim process? And what happens if the claim is denied? So first, let's talk about the reporting law, reporting of a loss. Tina, could you address that for us? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that this course has been approved for one hour of credit for community association managers in the insurance and financial education credit. So to the extent that you're going to get course credit, we will be contacting you to get your association license number so we can submit it to the state. So getting back to reporting a loss, all insurance policies, um, both homeowners and um, commercial properties, have conditions after a loss. And those are called duties in the event of a loss. What we have on the screen is one of the standard duties that is from a, actually it's from a condominium association policy from a pretty standard, um, it's actually Citizens Property Insurance Corporation standard policy provision. And what this provision says is that in the event of a loss or damage, you have to give the insurance company prompt notice of the loss or damage, including a description of the property involved. Now, the word prompt can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it begs the question as, when should the loss be reported? Prompt, unfortunately, isn't defined within the insurance policy. The Florida law defines prompt as, as, soon as, as soon as a reasonable person would know that there would have been a loss or something that would give rise to a loss. Obviously, with the start of hurricane season and tropical storm Colin hitting the panhandle at this point, once you know that there is landfall of a tropical storm, there would be potential wind damage or interior water damage, prompt notice would be to give the insurance company notice as soon as you knew there could be damage to your property. And a lot of times you may not recognize the extent of the damage of the property until you have an opportunity to start investigating. Gina, explain why it's important to give prompt notice from an insured or a policyholder standpoint. Right, absolutely. The failure to provide prompt notice can create an automatic presumption of prejudice in favor of the insurance company. And what that means is if you fail to give prompt notice, the insurance company has a presumption that you already gave late notice. And if late notice is given, then what happens is you then have the burden to prove that by giving that late notice, you're, you did not jeopardize the insurance company's rights. And the reason for this particular policy provision and the reason that late notice is such an issue within insurance claims in, in, in Florida is because insurance companies write their provisions so they have an opportunity to investigate the cause of the loss. So as an example, um, actually when I was doing defense work, I represented many of the insurance carriers through the state during the Hurricane Wilma claims and the supplements. So what would happen all too often would be an insured would repair their roof, not document the condition of the property. There would be no photographs or inspection reports, and then they would tell the insurance company that they had a loss. Now obviously there's prejudice there because the insurance company has no opportunity to look at the roof damage. So that's why it's really important. It's one of the, it's probably the most important thing when it comes to your post-loss obligations is to give prompt notice. So some practical considerations when reporting a loss is what should be reported. Now, what is reported in a date that is 
the loss is reported is something that will be memorialized throughout the claim process by both the insurance company and the pleadings if anything ever goes into litigation. So it's important that if there is water damage, it should be reported as water damage. If it's a roof leak or if it's from a plumbing, a particular pipe within the property, or if it's mold damage, that there's a consensus on what type of loss it is so it is reported consistently. It's very important to have an understanding of the cause of the loss, at least the area or scope of the loss, once you have an opportunity to report it. Pause on that for a second, Gina. So sometimes you may have um, some difficulty understanding what the loss is. Maybe uh, there might be some disagreement as to exactly the nature of the loss. And talk a little bit about um, why it might be important to meet with, talk with someone who is a professional in this industry in order to report the loss as something that's covered under the policy. Right, um, and we'll get to the different types of professionals a little bit later on in the presentation, but generally speaking, there are certain things within the insurance policy that may not be covered or may be subject to different deductibles. The way that an insured reports a loss could potentially change the coverages available or change what insurance deductible is applicable. Um, as an example, um, we are representing a client who initially reported a claim as a tropical storm claim because it coincided with a tropical storm. We come to find out after the investigation that it wasn't the result of a tropical storm. It was actually a different cause of loss. Now that changed the deductible from being in six figures to coming down to $5,000. And if it would have been investigated at the beginning to have some idea as to the cause of the loss, and the certain experts or engineers were retained at the beginning, it would have absolutely changed the way the claim was reported. So sometimes it is, I mean, obviously if you have tornado damage, it, it, it's kind of clear that the damage would be a result of a tornado. But when there's an issue as to the cause or the extent of the loss, it is important to consult with a, a public adjuster or engineer or contractor or someone who has professional experience to kind of give you a better roadmap or guideline as to how to report the claim. Do you have some thoughts as to who should report the loss? Um, who should report the loss? Uh, if, if, you know, obviously, this presentation is geared to property managers. Typically, what we see is the person who's going to be in charge, a quote unquote, in charge of the claim as the person who should report the loss. Typically, this person would be the contact person with the insurance company or with the professionals or with the attorneys if it comes in to the point that you're in litigation. Generally having one point of contact instead of dealing with all the members of an association board definitely makes the claim process smoother and a little bit of an easier tra transaction so you can always go to one person. So generally speaking, typically the board should have a conversation along with the property manager as to whether that person is going to be the president or the secretary, or it could be the property manager themselves. But typically, the duties and responsibilities under a policy fall within the insur on the insured. So having an insured representative be familiar with these obligations is a, is a good practice. Is there, is there a best practice as to how the law should be reported? A lot of times, too, the loss is reported to an insurance agent, and the insurance agent would fill out a, a cord loss notice. So typically how, typically how it proceeds is there would be a telephone call to the insurance company as soon as possible, um, giving prompt notice of the damages and that there is a potential insurance claim. And that could be followed up with uh, the filling out of an accord loss notice by, with the assistance of the insurance agent or the property manager and also could be followed up in, in writing as well. Once again, do you think when you're advising your clients that it's important for your client to be involved in that process and confirm that the loss of court form has actually been filed and filed correctly? Yes, absolutely. I mean, as we said, you saw and we're going to be talking a little bit about additional obligations after a loss. No matter what it comes down to, the contractual relationship is between the insured and the insurance company. So the insured needs to take the responsibility to be knowledgeable about the process and confirm 
that the documents and information that are submitted to the insurance company are true and accurate. Once you get to the point where the insurance company has questions about the claim, it's not going to, may not go in your favor if the insured sits back and says, I don't know, I had no involvement in this process at all. And I think we kind of covered the, if you fail to give prompt notice of the loss. Is there any, is there any black letter, black line, you know, established benchmarks by which um, if you fail to give notice by that date, you know, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, or some longer period of time, that that would deem your claim to be untimely? Under insurance policies, there is no black letter law. Um, actually, the Florida courts try to institute some kind of black letter and bright line rule, and it, it didn't work. It's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis as whether the notice given was prompt. In a second, I will talk about the statute of limitations because the statute of limitations is going to operate as a bar to your claim. But before we get there, um, some of the practical tips if you do end up reporting a loss either on behalf of your property or as a board member, to take notes of any conversations with the insurance company's representative. Get their contact information, get their phone numbers, their email addresses, ask when you should receive a response, and schedule the inspection. The quicker the inspection is scheduled, typically the quicker it's going to allow you as an insured to make the necessary repairs to protect your property and protect the unit owner. So the statute of limitations on hurricane losses was changed a few years ago, and you know this is going to really be the first season that it may come into play because we haven't had a hurricane make landfall since Wilma in October of 2005. So the statute of limitations has been changed that you have to report a claim within three years after the hurricane first made landfall or the windstorm caused the covered damage. Fail to do that within three years, and this includes supplemental claims or additional damages you may realize at some time later on down the road, will bar your claim. Most other insurance claims have a five-year statute of limitations. Um, this uh, statutory change was done after Hurricane Wilma because the courts were inundated with supplemental hurricane claims up to nine years after Hurricane Wilma had occurred. So you have a duty under the policy to provide prompt notice of the loss, and that should be as soon as reasonably practical under the conditions. But you have three years also to give notice under the statute of limitations and three years to file suit on any hurricane claim under the statute of limitations. And, and this is a very significant change in the law in Florida, Gina, because um, the average practitioner, the average lawyer, will probably presume that because the lawsuit would be based on a breach of contract, an insurance policy is a contract, and so the average lawyer who is not sensitive to this change would incorrectly assume that the lawyer on behalf of his or her client has five years to bring the lawsuit because they'll presume that it's a breach of contract claim and covered by the statute of limitations for contracts which allow for five years. But if they did so, they would miss potentially the statute of limitations by as much as two years because for a hurricane claim, it's only three years, correct? Absolutely, it's three years after the hurricane first made landfall, the windstorm caused the covered damage. And based on the definition of windstorm, that's likely going to apply to tropical storms as well, such as the tropical storm currently impacting northern Florida. And unlike with the notice provision, which Gina touched on earlier, where there's no clear bright line rule as to what could, what's considered timely notice, if you fail to report to file your lawsuit, assuming that you're going to have a lawsuit within three years, your claim, your lawsuit on behalf of your association will be absolutely barred. So now let's turn to um, preserving the property. Preserving uh, the property is another one of the obligations that a policyholder has to their insurance company. Uh, and it's uh, one of the many obligations 
that a policyholder has. We've already touched on your duties after the loss, that is, that you have to give prompt and timely notice. And we're going to be talking about some other obligations that a policyholder has as well. But let me just pause on that for a second because most policyholders, and for that matter, most lawyers and most other professionals don't know the obligations that they have under their insurance policy. And that's why it's really critical to understand what the policy provisions are in the policy that are applicable to your particular homeowner association, your particular property. And it's important, one of the things that's important for a property manager or a homeowner association is to have that information well before they suffer some type of casualty so that they know the different types of coverage that are available to them when such a loss occurs. So let's talk about the, the requirements for preserving the property. You have to preserve the physical property as best you can so that when the insurance company wants to, after they receive notice, wants the opportunity to inspect the property, they can both inspect the physical damage to the property as well as all the contents that might be claimed as damage. For example, if you have uh, some type of damage to a plumbing fixture, whether it's a pipe, uh, an internal pipe, or some type of an external plumbing fixture, you have an obligation to hold on to that pipe so that the insurance company can conduct its own investigation as to what caused that pipe to leak, break, etc. Similarly, uh, what we saw in, uh, quite a bit in uh, the various hurricanes we had starting going all the way back to 1992 with Andrew and then the 2004, 2005 storms and so forth is that obviously people have lots of interior damage to their homes or to their homeowner associations to, the, to, the, to their condominiums. And that, that can be their clothing, uh, appliances, etc. Once again, while it, it may seem most expedient to just throw that stuff away that you think has been ruined, you have an obligation to preserve that property at least for a reasonable opportunity to give, to give the insurance company a reasonable opportunity to inspect it. One of the things that we do and we advise our clients all the time is that before they're going to make any repairs, before they're going to change the, the property, the physical property in some way, before they're going to throw any clothes or any personal effects away, that they write a letter, uh, sometimes we assist them with that process, to the insurance company, let them know that they are about to make repairs and that before they make any kind of repairs, they're going to give the insurance company a full and complete opportunity to inspect the damage so they can assess the damage for themselves. So, Michael, what if they, for whatever reason, they, an association cannot preserve the damaged property? Sure. So they have to do whatever they can to document the damage as best they can. Um, whether they do that with the property manager, sometimes they hire a public adjuster, and sometimes they just have to do that themselves. So they can photograph the damage, uh, they can videotape the damage. Hopefully, um, in this day and age, folks are doing a good job of doing many of these things on the front end. So when, when you have a loss or damage to your property, one of the uh, very common defenses or arguments by an insurance company is that the damage that they're seeing post-loss post a storm, post some type of, of event, is that the damage that they're seeing pre-existed the storm. So one way to rebut that is to have photos of your property, videotape of your property in the condition that it existed pre-loss. Obviously, that requires some planning on the front end. But if you have a loss and you have damage and you have no way to preserve that property for some reason, then you, the best that you can do is to document it as best that you can um, with photos, with, uh, with videotape, 
maybe even having an expert, such as a roof roofing expert, come out to your property and document the loss for you so that you have an independent witness who can assist in that process as well. So um, we've talked a bit about the uh, process from an insurance, an insurance point of view in terms of documenting the loss, giving notice, et cetera. Jeff, could you talk a little bit about what the, uh, the insured ought to do with respect to, and, and in particular with homeowner association, in terms of maintaining minutes so that they don't get themselves in trouble when the insurance company comes and asks them for their minutes? Good afternoon, everyone. In the Condominium Homeowners Association context, uh, documenting the loss includes the board secretary or its designee, such as the property manager, um, taking proper minutes at board meetings. The minutes of a meeting document the decisions made during the meeting, and it provides a permanent and official record of the actions taken by the board. In terms of best practices, the minutes should be brief and concise and reflect what was done at a meeting as opposed to what was said at the meeting. There is no need to summarize debate, opinion, or commentary. The minutes should not be a transcript of the meeting. What's important in minute taking is the exact wording of each proposal or motion, who made the motion, and whether it was adopted, rejected, or tabled. Also, it's important to include any financial decisions that were made. This way, in the event of a dispute, the minutes can be the best proof of whether a proposal was adopted and the exact wording of a motion. In sum, the, meeting, the minute meeting should be action-oriented and decision-focused. If the board is meeting to discuss and take action on an insurance claim, the minutes are another way of documenting the loss and they should be consistent with the details of how the claim was reported. So Gina, if you could talk a little bit about this subject, because I know oftentimes uh, a claim gets reported for a homeowners association, and uh, back when you were representing insurance companies, one of the first things you would do, I'm sure, is to request all the minutes of, a, of, of the association. What kind of things would you be looking for when you were um, reviewing those minutes? You are correct. I have spent hours and days in basements reviewing minute, meeting minutes from associations and homeowner associations. And typically what is looked for from the insurance company perspective is evidence of pre-existing damage, um, any mention of prior damages at the property. One of the big red flags is sometimes the lack of information within the meeting minutes. Um, meaning, meaning like lack of maintenance information? Um, Lack of the loss. So, for example, if there's a huge water leak at the association and they're making an insurance claim, but you go back and look at the meeting minutes for the six months post this alleged loss and there's no mention of it at all, that's a huge red flag to the insurance company that, well, did this loss one occur when they said it occurred or did it occur at all? So or to the extent that to they're the extent, Yeah, so I agree with Jeff that meeting minutes should be consistent with the way the loss is reported. So if there is going to be a loss reported in the meeting minutes, say, you know, we had a loss on this date, it's being reported on this date, um, you know, whether you form a committee to handle the insurance claim or however it may be, be consistent in your meeting minutes. And um, I think Jeff had mentioned it too, you don't need to put in your meeting minutes every opinion from every uh, attendee or unit owner about the cause of the damage, you know, that, that information could unfortunately be confusing regarding what really happened and it may give the insurance company a reason to expect that the claim didn't happen as it did or a reason to talk to, take recorded statements or eventual depositions of every single person who ever mentioned anything about that claim within a five-year history. Um, and obviously, as a board, and you know, the insurance companies are allowed to take certain statements, which we will get to, but to the extent that you can narrow it and the extent you can focus on really what happened, you want to do so. Similarly, if you could talk a little bit about, because I know this is unfortunately common and it's a common bugaboo with associations and the way in which they uh, 
communicate and then the kind of information that finds its way into minutes. Talk a little bit about some of the gems that you've seen over the years in terms of what minutes have reflected prior to the loss and how, how the way in which those communications can work against a an, an homeowners association when they ultimately experience a real loss. No, absolutely. I mean, there's, to my understanding, it always seems like there's some unit owner who's complaining about mold or uh, leaks. And if there's a history of repeated leaks at the association where it doesn't look like anything was done to stop those leaks or a lack of maintenance or a lack of maintenance logs at the property, that shows the insurance company a, a history of neglect, essentially. In addition to the meeting minutes, one thing that I have always found very informative is the maintenance log. When somebody calls in a report to a unit or to one of the common areas, how does the association document that and how does the association keep that record? Because the lack of those maintenance and the lack of that information in the meeting minutes, you know, even saying, you know, maintenance so and supervisor has addressed all pending issues that could also be a red flag to prove what the insurance company wants to show is almost a you know, deteriorating condition of a building, even though there is some real loss at the property from a specific covered event. Sure. So can we turn now to mitigating damages? And before we do that, I was remiss at the outset to say that you that you folks out there in cyber world, you're able to, uh, to chat with us um, by sending us a chat message. And we will, uh, as we proceed through, we will try and respond to you. Uh, and you can direct the question to any or all of us uh, or the comments to any or all of us. And we'll try and be as responsive to you as possible in real time. So now turning to mitigating the damages, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, Gina? And, and I, I think that's another responsibility and obligation that a policyholder has. Correct. This is one of the other duties after loss. The insured has an obligation to take all reasonable steps to protect the covered property from further damage and keep a record of the expenses necessary. Um, this is to protect the covered property. So, for example, if you have an association property that has windows blown out during a storm, there is an obligation probably depending on responsibility for the windows, but the condominium as well as the unit owner to protect the property and not allow water to continue to get in. So whether that be to temporarily replace the windows with something quick just to get something up there or to board the windows or put some other type of waterproofing material up, you have an obligation to take these reasonable steps to protect the covered property. The reason for this provision in the policy is because an insurance company will have certain obligations to pay for the damages caused by a covered event. If further damages result that are due to an insured lack of mitigating the damages, those damages are not covered within the insurance policy because it was then at that point the insured's responsibility to stop further damages from occurring. So if you have that example when the window is blown out and you just leave the window blown out and then it floods the interior, the insurance company has a pretty good argument that they're not going to owe for the interior damages. One of the other important things on this is you have to keep a record of the expenses. If a lot of times, and this was really true more for homeowners after the storms, there was a lot of roofing contractors that came by, maybe not were licensed or maybe were just handyman. And you know, sometimes you need to employ those services in the event of an emergency. But having saying that you paid so and so five hundred dollars in cash without the name of the individual, without a receipt, without any documentation whatsoever, is going to be problematic to you getting reimbursed for that particular expense because these expenses are and should be covered by your insurance policy. So some of the considerations when mitigating the damages, as Michael said earlier, you do have a duty to preserve the damaged property. So clean up to the extent that you can, but if possible, don't throw everything away. Put it in an area that can be inspected. Um, if necessary, if it's a plumbing leak, and you need to shut off the water supply. Or if there is some type of uh, electrical issue, obviously turn off the electricity to 
uh, protect the safety and welfare of the residents as well. Additionally, if there is some ex extensive water damage interior, you do want to have that conversation as to whether you need to hire a remediation service specialist. Now, typically the remediation service specialists are water extraction companies or mold remediation companies who come out to the property and um, put fans out that will remove certain amounts of drywall or carpeting. If you do hire a remediation company, make sure that you, you know, check the company's background, call for their re references, vet the company. Um, a lot of times after a, a major event, an, in an association property will be have an influx of these services trying to come to the property to get them the job. So it's important to do your due diligence and hire the right remediation company and monitor what they're doing. Monitor how long they're there, how many fans they have in, and take photographs of the equipment if at all possible. Um, there's, a, there's a big surge of fraudulent remediation companies within the insurance industry right now. And without going into details, it's been a very, very hot topic, both which has prompted changes in the law and changes in insurance policies, none of which are favorable for Florida's consumers. So it is important to um, pay attention to who you hire and really monitor that situation. And it's very important to um, look at the contracts that you enter into with these remediation folks um, because it has been quite in vogue over the last few years for remediation specialists who tend to be the first responders, the first folks out on the scene to enter into contracts with the uh, policyholder which provide for them to get an assignment of the benefits, assignment of the proceeds from the insurance company. And if that's what the insured really intends and wants to do, that's certainly the insured's right to do so. But that's something, that type of contract as opposed to your typical fee for services is something that should be thought about carefully before entering into such a contract. So let's turn now to the claim investigation because you've had a loss and you've properly reported that loss and now the insurance company is going to go about its process in terms of investigating the loss. And the very first thing it's going to do, as we touched on earlier, is it's going to want to come out and inspect the property. And it has the right to do so under the insurance policy and the policyholder has the absolute obligation to provide access to the property and to uh, make its property available to the insurance company for inspection, testing, analysis, and to provide the insurance company with all manner of documentary information, including its books and records. So that's a good segue um, to, to you, um, uh, either Gina or Jeff, to talk a little bit about the, the obligations from the policyholder's standpoint in terms of what kinds of documentation the policyholder is obligated to have available and to produce to the insurance company. Yeah, and the insurance company typically one of the first things that they're going to send out is the notification that they've received an acknowledgement of the loss. Then they typically watch for the inspection and they have the opportunity to either ask for documentation and you have the obligation to provide or they have the, they have the option to come and review all of your records. So there, there's two kind of separate paths that they can take. If they ask for production of documents, you really need to do your due diligence and give them what they ask for. Um, it is an absolute obligation under the policy. Um, if there's a question of whether or not the documents are relevant or whether they need everything, we do suggest either speaking with a public adjuster or an attorney with respect to the extent of documents that you need to provide. But failure to produce documents, even though you may not think they're important, can bar your coverage. One of the other things they can do is the, the, prop, the document inspection where they come and they ask for all your boxes of meeting minutes and invoices and unit owner files for the past seven to 10 years. And in that case, 
you also want to do your due diligence and go through those files to make sure there's not somehow an attorney client privilege or other confidential information that is within those documents that you may not realize. So one of the things they absolutely always are going to request is um, any repairs to the property in the past five years, construction documents, renovations, photos of the property prior to the loss, estimates, um, you know, proofs of purchase, meeting minutes, maintenance logs, and, and any other information regarding the condition of the property. Now, Jeff, can you kind of give a discussion of the statutory duties to keep certain records? Because most insurance companies assume that since the association has a statutory duty, then all those documents should be available to them. There's two separate issues. There's the issue of what documents are required to be furnished by an insured under the insurance policy and the statutory duty of the association to keep certain records. Every Florida condominium and homeowners association is required by Florida law to maintain and keep certain documents as part of its official record. Um, in the Florida Condominium Act, that's Chapter 718, um, 111, subsection 12, and in the Florida HOA statute, it's 720.303, subsection 4. Um, generally, there's a laundry list of specific documents that the associations, whether it's a condominium or an HOA, are required to maintain. And they're required to maintain them for seven years. Um, things like plans and permits and warranties, minutes of all meetings, rules of the association. But what's interesting, um, there's a catch-all provision under both the Florida Condominium Act and the Homeowners Association Act that requires the associations to keep and maintain, quote, all other written records of the association not specifically included in the foregoing, which are related to the operation of the association. If we start with the premise that the association is obligated under its declaration to maintain and repair the com common elements, um, the best practice here would be for the association to maintain um, documents such as receipts and bills, inventories of damaged and undamaged property um, for seven years. That's an expectation that the insurance company has. It's not specifically enumerated in the statute, um, but it could fall within the um, catch-all provision. And so um, I advise my condominium and homeowners association clients to maintain those records for seven years in, in an abundance of caution. So uh, on the screen now is a typical provision in an insurance policy, a homeowner's, excuse me, a home, an HOA policy, uh, and, and this relates to document production. And again, it touches on what both Gina and, and Jeff have already discussed, which is that uh, at the insurance company's request, and you can assume and safely assume that the insurance company will request it, and whether they request it or not, you should, you should be prepared to provide it to the insurance company and to whoever is assisting the association in documenting the claim. And what you need to be able to provide is a complete inventory of the damaged and undamaged property, which lays out the quantities, the costs, the values and amounts claimed. And you should be prepared to provide the backup for whatever is being claimed. Backup will include bills, receipts, and all other documents that will support the claim. As I always tell my clients, it is better to give them and to have available to them more information than less. Another requirement, and this is one of the most significant requirements under the insurance policy, is a sworn statement and proof of loss. Once again, up on the screen is a typical provision in the insurance policy, comes under usually the section of the insurance policy that deals with the uh, duties after a loss. And that is the obligation to provide a written sworn statement and proof of loss. This is a form that the insurance company will provide to the policy holder 
during the claim process. And if the insurance company doesn't, the whoever's handling the claim on behalf of the policyholder can request one, or uh, it's easy. It should be readily easy with some assistance to generate one on your own. These forms typically at the bottom of the form will have a perjury provision which will essentially say that any misstatement on the form subjects the author and, 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 the, uh, and whoever the author is acting on behalf of, in, in this case an association, to perjury for any misstatement and, that the, and caution that all statements must be true and accurate. So preparing this document, this legal document, once again is something that ought to be done with a professional to assist uh, the association in doing so because its accuracy or inaccuracy could be used against the, uh, the policy holder. The, the, this provision requires, the one that's on the screen, requires the policy holder to provide it within 60 days. Uh, some provisions vary in terms of the time period, but it is absolutely an obligation for the insurer to do so timely, and failure to do so timely and properly can result in the claim not only being denied, but being properly denied. Uh, lots of times, various issues uh, occur with respect to sworn statements and proof of loss. Sometimes the particular cause of loss, which is one of the questions on, the, on this form, it's not clear, and so uh, it's important for the insurer or whoever's filling out the form to explain any issues with respect to the determination of the cause. Sometimes the amount of the loss is not completely determined yet, so you might submit a partial proof of loss. Once again, these, uh, the, these issues in terms of how to properly fill out the form are items that ought to get some professional, that the policyholder would be wise to get some professional assistance in filling out. The next, the next uh, obligation uh, that's also significantly under, uh, that's important to a policyholder with respect to uh, a claim is what's called an examination under oath. An examination under oath, again, is another one of these obligations in an insurance policy that most folks, and even most lawyers, are not aware of this obligation. I would say probably since our raft of claims and hurricanes since 1992, more folks are a little bit more, a little bit more sensitized to it. But I would say the overwhelming majority of people, including lawyers, are unaware of this obligation in insurance policy. And what an examination under oath is, is essentially a deposition, a sworn statement, where a lawyer will take the examination of the policyholder, sometimes other folks in addition to the policyholder, in order to learn everything there is about the claim, the amount of the claim, how the loss occurred, everybody who has knowledge about the claim. Generally speaking, uh, although it's, it's not always the case, but generally speaking, if the insurance company is asking for an examination under oath, if they are exercising their right to demand an examination under oath, it is because they believe that there is something suspect about the claim. Suspect doesn't necessarily mean that they think there's something fraudulent about the claim. Maybe they believe there's a coverage issue. Maybe they, they believe there's some issue in terms of how the loss was reported. But generally speaking, if they are requesting an examination under oath, they are not doing so just to simply check a box and confirm that there's coverage and how much they're going to pay on the claim, but instead are looking to develop some potential defense or some potential argument that they have that the claim is not covered for some reason. So at this juncture, if the homeowners association gets a request for an examination under oath and it has not yet engaged a professional to assist them, this should be an absolute clear red flag signal to the homeowners association that they absolutely should seek legal advice at that point. The 
uh, on the screen there's some questions. We touched on what's an examination under oath. Uh, we touched on a little bit uh, who should appear for the examination under oath. Uh, generally speaking, the the person who should uh, should appear for the examination under oath is going to be the person with most knowledge about the claim who speaks for the homeowners association. There's been some development in terms of insurance policies, which I'm not going to get into in any great length, where the insurance company seeks to impose an obligation on people who are not obligated under the insurance policy. For example, a public adjuster. The public adjuster is not a party to the insurance policy, but no one could argue that the public adjuster is a person who has significant knowledge. Having said that, generally speaking, we advise our clients that the obligation is only imposed on those people who are actually parties to the insurance policy, which typically is someone acting on behalf of the association. And that can be a property manager. The knowledge that's required of that person is to be as knowledgeable as possible as, as to all factual aspects of the claim. Obviously, though, whether it's a property manager or the president of the association, they're not required to have technical knowledge that would be uh, better suited for an expert. The, the next um, provision that we typically find in insurance policies is the appraisal provision. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about some developments in insurance policies where some insurance companies have taken this provision out of the policy, but this, which, which has occurred um, in recent years. But most policies still contain an appraisal provision or some form of an appraisal provision. For most folks, when they think of appraisal, they think of appraisals for the fair market value of property. And once again, that's not what we're talking about here. And, and once again, something that is foreign to the average uh, lawyer and foreign to, to uh, most uh, folks who are confronting an insurance law. What an appraisal provision is, is simply an alternative dispute mechanism, which which the purpose is to, to narrow the dispute that is going to potentially occur between the insurance company and its policyholder. And the purpose is for the insurance company and the policyholder to both, through their representatives, come up with a valuation as to what the amount of the loss is. Uh, if, for example, there is roof damage to the property, the insured will have someone acting on their behalf, called an appraiser, who will determine what that appraiser believes will be the cost to repair or replace that roof. Similarly, the insurance company will present someone acting on their behalf to evaluate the damage to the roof, what they think the, the cost will be to, to repair it, what's the scope of the damage, et cetera. What, they, what these two appraisers do not do is determine whether or not there's coverage for this damage. All they determine is the amount. And once they make that determination, the two, the two folks, the representative for the insurance company and the representative for the policyholder, if they're in agreement, that's great. And that's a binding agreement then between the insured and the insurance company as to what the amount of the loss is. And that will be binding on both parties. If, however, they're unable to reach an agreement, then there's a mechanism under the insurance policy, typically, to appoint a third party who will act as the umpire to resolve the dispute and either agree with the insurance company's number or, in, or agree with the insured's number or present a separate number, which either or both can agree on. And that number then, once that is agreed upon or established, that becomes the amount of the loss for the claim. And it can never go any higher than that loss. Let's now talk about some of the ethical requirements for an adjuster. 
Gina, could you touch on that for us? No, absolutely. So as Michael said, the claim investigation is essentially going to start with a letter from the insurance company as well as a property inspection. The property inspection most often is going to be done by an adjuster who is hired on behalf of the insurance company. They can either be an in-house adjuster or they can be an independent adjuster. An independent adjuster is typically a third-party company that is hired on behalf of the insurance company to adjust losses for the insurance company. An independent adjuster is not your adjuster. An independent adjuster is the insurance company's adjuster. The only time, and then we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, public adjusters are adjusters who work on behalf of policyholders. So I, I talk to a lot of clients who say, oh, our adjuster's handling it, our adjuster's doing that. but the independent adjuster will always have the insurance company's best interest in mind, even though they do have an obligation to have a fair and unbiased investigation of the law. So I just want to run over a couple of the ethical requirements of adjusters, um, because more often than not, we hear complaints from policyholders that the adjuster was out there and they didn't tell me this or they did that. So. The adjusters have an obligation to be truthful and unbiased when they report their claims and their, their estimates to the insurance company. The unfortunate situation is a lot of times, you know, from working with the insurance companies and a lot of independent adjusters, if they're writing high estimates for insured, insurance companies are going to be less likely to hire them in the future because they feel like they may be costing them too much money. So the ethical requirements are there to kind of keep everybody in check. So they have an obligation to act with dispatch and due diligence, diligence in achieving a proper disposition of the claim. Now this is important because you have a right to have the adjuster come out promptly, you have a right to have communication promptly, and you have a right to have re, you know, return calls and coverage decisions from the insurance company. So if, to the extent that the adjusters are not responding, you, you can you know, talk to a professional, a public adjuster, or an, a, an attorney, or you know, remind the adjuster that they have ethical requirements to respond to you. One of the other things adjusters are not allowed to do is they are not allowed to tell an insured that they should not hire an attorney or they should not hire a public adjuster. They cannot advise against the retention of counsel or public adjusters. A lot of times independent adjusters are going to want to get the claim resolved without the involvement of an attorney or a public adjuster, but the adjuster does not have a right to tell you you shouldn't hire this person because of X, Y, Z. To the extent that they're doing that, one, it's an unethical practice um, and it also is a, constitutes an unfair claim settlement practice. and I would be wary of anyone who's dissuading you from hiring someone to protect your own interests because obviously they're there to protect the insurance company's interests. One of the other obligations is they shall not knowingly fail to advise an insured of their options in accordance with the terms of the policy. One of the times that this comes into play is with particularly extra coverages such as extra expenses or the enforcement of ordinance and law. For example, if you have to, as an association, hire generators to get the power back on for a building after a loss for whatever reason, sometimes those expenses are covered. The insurance adjuster has an obligation to tell you under the policy whether those certain expenses are covered or not. They cannot fail to advise you of your, your policy conditions and your, their insurance company's obligations. Let me just say one word on... Uh, independent adjusters before I go to the next topic. The, the notion of independent adjusters is a bit of a misnomer because the word uh, connotes to you that if they're independent, that must mean that they're not biased and that they work just as much for the association as they do for the insurance company. But the origin of the, of the phrase independent adjuster comes simply from the fact that they do not work in-house for the insurance company, but are an outside vendor that the insurance company con contracts for service. But make no mistake, of course, they are contracted to work for the insurance company in adjusting the loss. So let's turn, turn now to experts. Jeff, you represent a, 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 an association 
Um, they've just suffered some type of, of significant loss, and they're considering um, what should they do in order to evaluate the claim and, you know, both from how should they repair it, how should they remediate it, what experts maybe that they need in order to convince the insurance company as to the scope of their loss and the cause of the loss. What, what is the responsibilities and obligations of the board of directors of an association when confronted with such a situation? Well, Michael, the starting point is, is to acknowledge that the board of directors and every officer of the board of directors has a fiduciary duty to the association and to the members or owners of the association, which requires them to act in good faith and the best interest of the members of the association. And to exercise their duty of due care and diligence, boards routinely hire and retain professionals and other experts to help them make decisions on their behalf. Essentially, a lot of times these folks are lay people and they need experts to rely upon to exercise their business judgment. And these experts include public adjusters, remediators, contractors, and engineers. The duty, the, free, the fiduciary duty, um, is one in which the board tends to simply hire experts. They have to hire appropriate and competent professionals. And in doing so, best practices include doing due diligence to confirm the professional license history of these folks, uncovering any complaints, other red flags, and most importantly, checking references from other properties. So, so now, um, we get to the final um, moment in a claim um, and, the cl and the moment that you don't want to experience if you are representing the homeowner the, or the HOA, which is that the insurance company has issued a denial letter. Uh, the only good thing about a denial letter is that at least you know formally that the insurance company has denied the claim and that gives you your ticket, if you will, to file in a lawsuit. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the insurance company uh, takes a long time in its investigative process, uh, inundates the insured with various requests, whether they be requests for information, inspections, rejections of proofs of loss, requirements that they submit new proofs of loss, and essentially puts the insured in claim investigation purgatory where the insurer doesn't know whether or not uh, they need to comply further with the policy demands, whether they should hire a professional to assist them, and whether or not their claim uh, is ripened into a lawsuit. But with a claim denial, uh, the insured now knows without a doubt that they can, they can file a lawsuit if they feel like the claim has been wrongfully denied. Wrongfully denied. And that's essentially what their option is. Um, they can attempt to get the insurance companies to reconsider a claim denial. In my experience, rarely, if ever, does an insurance company reconsider its denial once it's denied a claim. Um, all, all or nearly all claim denials will have a clause at the end of the letter, which usually will be written by a lawyer, that says, if you have any additional information, you can provide that to us to help us reconsider. Um, I've seen that boilerplate uh, prescription on almost every claim denial, and I can tell you um, categorically that I've not seen any claim where I have provided an insurance company with additional information where they changed their mind. Uh, in addition, uh, there is something known as supplemental claims, and so sometimes when the claim process is completed and paid, et cetera, uh, an insured realizes it has additional damage, and so they can file a supplemental claim. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, on behalf of Jeff and Gina, on behalf of Berger Singerman, on behalf of our DRT, our dispute resolution team, we thank you very much for your patience. We thank you very much for your attention. We thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to spend uh, your lunch time with us. And, uh, and we look forward to answering any questions, whether now or in the future, if you have them, and to reach out to any or all of us.
you thank you for your time today. We're going to stay on for a couple more minutes. If anyone has any questions, um, you can go ahead and mute the chat.